so re regarding understanding the context of it, um, that that's you know that's commonly said, but for the people that present uh what I just said and being a textual critic in that matter, they would read the whole context and show, for example, in Isaiah one uh eleven on down, it also mentioned about new moons and Sabbaths that he said done away with, right? Mm -hmm. But also right under that, it kind of explained why when it mentioned you know the blood on the hands. So I got a question, right? Um I I understand that humankind or our father's culture the culture of our fathers would indeed uh have you know the sacrifices involved we would see uh literature saying that noah asa made an altar and that even cain and abel was making altars but i was wondering like the 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 the, the very very uh deepest providence and in, in origin <clears throat> excuse me uh of it regarding the design the design and desire and how the most high created humankind um because i wanted to see instances where maybe it was it was done in mount eden in the garden before they was open up to their shame and he had the so-called slayed animal and covering them up in them garments you know so what I'm saying? let me let me let me interject for one moment and kind okay. of explain something right so Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, doesn't just represent a physical location, but a spiritual station. Right. I'll, I'll emphasize that. Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden is not just a physical location. It is more so a spiritual station, right? So when we speak of Adam Harishon in Gan Eden, in, in Adam inside the Garden of Eden, we're speaking of man or Adam in a very high spiritual station. There is no requirement from Adam or Eve that they bring offerings of any kind. They're already operating on a very high spiritual station. The idea of offerings, which is what I was going to um, speak on in, in this um, commentary today, but you know, we we, it, we we might not always be able to each jump in and interject, but I, I'll use this moment to explain. The word korban, which we have for offering, is rooted in the word koreb, which means to draw near. So the idea of an offering, first and foremost, is not that I, needed, I need to present an offering because I'm bad, and that's the only way I can get right with the Almighty is to have this offering. No, because as Leviticus 1 is actually laying out, the very first offerings described in the book of Leviticus chapters 1, 2, and into 3 have nothing to do with sin. They all have to do with drawing closer to the Almighty. Yeah. They have nothing to do with sin. The sin offerings don't begin until the fourth, fifth, and sixth chapters. That's where the sin offerings begins. The kata offering, chapters one, two, and three are not talking about sin yet. So everyone has this warped idea that when we present an offering before Hashem, before the Almighty, it's because we're wicked. Well, the Ola. The burnt offering is called an Ola, Ayin, Lamed, Hey. Just as when I go to Israel, it will be called an Aliyah. I'm making an ascent. So the idea of bringing an Ola in Leviticus 1 is the idea of a righteous man or a righteous woman whom, like Rabbi Mordecai is alluding to, although they have not physically sinned, all sin begins with thoughts. So the Ola is presented on behalf of the sins that arise in one's thoughts, which becomes the sins that one begins to speak and eventually becomes the sins that one begins to do. So you can't go into a court of law, however, and charge someone for sin in thought. You can't do that. But what this offering presents, the Ola, the righteous man or the righteous woman is saying, listen, although I have not physically sinned, I am aware of my own thoughts. And I want to be cleansed before the Almighty based on that idea. So that's why those offerings are being presented, right? And that's a powerful conversation to have. But mm. the idea of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve originally was on a much higher spiritual station. So there was no need for any offering of any kind, period. They were not operating from a space of carnality, which is why well, you, you'll notice that 
the garments that the creator makes for them, the word or is skin. And some people actually take that literally. The sages do take that literally, that he made garments of skins for them because prior to this sin, Adam and Eve is completely spiritual beings, completely mm. spiritual beings. And that's a much higher conversation, right? So right, there's so. no need for any offering in the Garden of Eden. So I wouldn't use the Garden of Eden as a template to discredit the sacrificial system. I would mm. first understand that no offering is needed in that spiritual station simply because of the level they're operating on. Remember, Adam and Eve and even the snake are freely speaking with the Almighty, freely speaking with him, enjoying what some might call prophecy, but I'm going to say what they had was even more than prophecy, right? Prophecy that Hashem says, when there's a prophet among you, I speak to him in a dream, I speak to him in a vision. Okay, with regard to Adam and Eve in the sin, the Bible says they heard the voice of the Lord God manifesting itself in the garden and walking among them. What? What prophet could say that? So it shows you the spiritual station and level that they were on. So no, they would not require an offering of any kind at that station because at the base level, an offering, a koreb, a korban, represents drawing close to the Almighty. Adam and Eve already had that. Because of the sin, the Creator separated them from that. And from that station, their children go on to be the first people we see on record to present offerings, to get back to that level. But in the garden, there was no offerings because they were already at the level of zivkut, right? Attachment, divkut, attachment. They were already there. The idea of a korban is that one is seeking to align oneself spiritually with the creator. So there would be no need for korban. So that what I'm really trying to say is, I can't use the, 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 the fact that there are no offerings in the Garden of Eden as a way to, you know, disannul the sacrificial system because we have to think about what the sacrificial system represents. It's a mm -hmm. system geared at being a means to draw closer to the Almighty in spirit. Adam and Eve were already there in the Garden, so they didn't require a sacrificial system. But once sin came in the way through them and then their children were born, now you see for the very first time a sacrificial system, something that would need to bring them once again closely spiritually aligned. Right. Uh, I, I, I like the way you broke that down. I'm very familiar with the explanation you just said, but you just broke it down in the best way I heard so far. So check this out. Uh, my question is, do you reckon... In, in Ezekiel in the forest, uh, the coming temple with Hebraic literature being so poetic, do you find that the sacrifices being made there is a literal sacrifice or more figurative? I, I think that the sacrifices described in the future temple are more allegorical than they are physical. Uh, to what extent could I quantify that allegory? We'd have to go into those chapters of Ezekiel and talk about it, which by the way, we can, That, would, but that would be a different setting and a different study and a different teaching, right? We could do that in our Torah class or we could bring that here live. I would have no problem doing that. But since you're asking for my personal opinion, I'm certainly gonna give it to you. I think that what, 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 what the sages at least say with regard to sin in Olam Hava, the world to come, is that sin itself would be swallowed up. Right? It, would, it would no longer exist, right? Because the Bible says, the Torah says, at the end of days, all of your people shall be righteous. All of your people shall be righteous, right? So a discussion is had in the oral tradition that this alludes to the nullification of the entire commandments as well, which is something that the Apostle Paul may have jumped the gun on. It's taught in the oral tradition that in the end of days, being that everyone is going to be righteous, there's no need for the law. And allow me to explain what that means. We have laws that deter us from bad behavior. In fact, most of the laws given to the children of Israel are a deterrent against bad behavior. 
But if at the end of days, the book says all of your people will be righteous, i.e. none of them will have bad behavior, then that means hundreds of laws no longer apply. Now, when you talk about the remaining laws, which deal with how we draw closer to the Almighty, we have to also consider something else. The Torah says in several places that the bond and union that we would achieve with the Almighty would be on a much higher level. So the laws remaining are only there to bring us closer. But at the end of days, it's already prophesied that we'd be closer. So if there's no need for laws in the end of days to serve as a deterrent against wickedness because everyone's going to be righteous, that means at least 65 to 75 percent of the laws of the Torah are gone. So we have 613 in general, about 75 percent are now gone. So the remaining percent, what does that represent? The laws that deal with how we get close to Hashem. But in the world to come, all of us will be one with Hashem. So what does that leave us with what the oral tradition described as the nullification of the commandments, right? Mm -hmm. This discussion is described in the oral tradition where it talks about sha'atness, right? A person putting on garments of linen and wool. And the oral tradition says, why does the Torah forbid that you and I can't wear wool and linen, but the high priest is? More importantly, why does the Torah forbid that you and I can't wear wool and linen, but we could put it put wool and linen on a dead body. And the sages say, because the dead are free. Free of what? Free of commandments. Because once you're dead, there's no commandment to keep. There's nothing that you can do. You'll be judged. And after you're judged, you're brought into that space of being perfected before the Almighty. So what I'm saying to you is, these are concepts that are extremely deep and are extremely powerful. But like with all things, there are stages when it comes to understanding various ideas. If I go on a, my live stream later on today, and I title the live stream, in the world to come, at the end of days, the Torah is null and void. Every single Israelite will cast stones at me and will call me a charlatan and will say all kinds of things about me. When we actually go through the Torah, we'll see that everything I'm saying is exactly right there. Because keeping the laws of the Torah automatically entails that there's a disconnect and a divide. Remember, Adam and Eve have three commandments. Why do we have 613 today? Because there's so much of a divide. Noah had seven commandments. By the time of Abraham, there's about 246. Some people say 286. But by the time of Moses, there's 613. So even as the apostle Paul says, the law was given due to sin and transgression, which some people don't understand in context. They're thinking Paul who they forget is also a rabbi. Remember, Paul learns from Ramban Gamliel, the greatest rabbi of his era. And Paul would have been his greatest pupil. So let's put Paul's words into proper context. When he says the law was given due to sin and transgression, he is absolutely right. It's the reason why we now have 613 commandments, even though Abraham had much fewer even though Noah had much fewer, even though Enoch had much fewer, and even though Adam and Eve had three. So clearly the law was given due to sin and transgression. So watch this. When sin and transgression is nullified, you'll get back to the era of Adam and Eve. What commandments were they given to be fruitful and multiply? Well, we won't need that as a commandment in the world to come. So what other commandments would there be? They were told to... Um, to till the garden and to keep it. That commandment won't be, so we eliminated two out of three. So what is the remaining commandment? Not to touch or eat from the tree of life. Well, all of us will eat and touch from the tree of life. So I now ask you, what commandments are remaining? And as you can see, zero, mm -hmm. none. So the entire commandments are nullified in the world to come, right? But, 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 but again, all of this has to be understood in stages of understanding. Because if you say this to someone that just came into this knowledge of the mm -hmm. Bible, and then you now start talking that, they're completely lost, which is why the sages have parameters, fixed parameters about how a person comes into various levels of knowledge in this system. One of the greatest areas of knowledge with the most parameters is the Kabbalistic tradition. 
Because in order to even delve into the Kabbalistic mm -hmm. tradition, one has to be a master in the written text of the Torah from, from what we all can pick up and see. A person has to master that. When I speak to people that tell me that they don't believe in Kabbalah and they think it's witch work, they think it's magic and they think it's made up, I start asking them basic questions about the Bible. And it confirms what I already assumed. They don't even understand basic ideas presented in the written text. So of course you don't understand what the Kabbalah is because you haven't even mastered the basics. That's like telling me trigonometry is made up, but then I give you a test on addition and subtraction, you fail horribly. Well, no wonder you think trigonometry is made up. You have a horrible understanding of the basics. You, you can't even multiply and subtract and divide. Like that's embarrassing, but you want to critique trigonometry as a method and as a science. This is what I'm talking about. All right, bet. One more question. Uh, regarding what you said, the world to come. If I'm mistaken, Rabbi Manus Friedman uh kind of mentioned about uh and not only Rabbi Manus Friedman, Ben I me mentioned that if we stand aside to see what's what's going on in the world, uh, because we have an idea of a fantasy world, uh, then we are a part of the crime that's being done to the earth and and we're gonna have we're gonna have to take on that judgment also rabbi manis freeman if i'm mistaken that was him that mentioned that uh you know it's a dangerous man to think of a, a fantasy world i wanted to ask you when you say the world to come that uh that uh the the the, the law of being fruitful and multiply won't matter what word to come are you referring to? You referring to like the Makut Ha Eretz or? So the world to come that I am referring to in the most basic terms, right? If, if I say Malkut, this, this, and this is what I'm talking about again in general. If I say Malkut Ha Eretz, I'm pretty sure you know I just lost 98% of the audience. Mm. I can speak towards that, but I think even you would know I just lost 98% of the audience because 98% of the audience can't define what we even mean when we say malchut, right? The malchut of tif eret, the malchut of uh, netzak or hold. What, what does that mean to people who don't understand Kabbalistic knowledge? Which means, my, my dad told me something years ago, right? He said, the goal of communication is to connect with your audience. So when you're using verbiage that loses your audience, you fail at the basic level of the goal of communication, which is to connect. Let me tell you something, and I don't typically say this, but I'll say this in this moment. I know much more than I discuss openly. There's been nobody that has been invited to my channel that has said something that I have never heard. But it takes humility to be that kind of person, to harness and understand so much knowledge, so much insight, so much understanding, yet still open one's ears in humility to hear the thoughts and opinions of others. I also don't teach everything that I know because I also know everything is not for everybody. And you'll always know someone that has mastered a body of knowledge because the way in which they deliver it, man, woman, and child will receive it like I'm speaking to one and the same person. In other words, I'll deliver this information and a child will understand, an adult will understand. No matter what level they're on, everybody will understand. And that's how you know when a teacher is present and when somebody is really in touch with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. So when I say the world to come, I'm speaking of the final messianic era, the era that the Bible says, and the wolf shall lay with the lamb. And what we're, we're talking about essentially Isaiah chapter uh, two, where we achieve universal peace and global harmony, not just with man and man, but with, with man and nature. So whenever the oral tradition speaks of olam hava, the world to come, it's the ideal end time that Hashem desired from since before the creation of the world, man's ultimate perfected estate. There, there is no in-between when we're speaking of olam hava. Now, can we have that conversation Kabbalistically? Uh, absolutely. But because we're not really delving there now, I'm going to say no. So that's why I'm answering in a general way. But I'm also using a moment as a teachable moment because I'm saying in your hearing and to everyone that if the goal of communication is to connect with my audience, then why would I be using terminology that most of the audience can't follow? Why? Because it makes me sound smart 
And if it makes me sound smart, who am I trying to convince? Someone else? You see, I know what I know. And I know that I am blessed with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. I know that. But I don't need to, to show the world that with all that I've got. Because that would be a need in me that, I, that, that the ego is seeking to satisfy, right? So if something comes out for me that's powerful and deep, maybe it's because others are in the room and because of the level of conversation, there's a need now to go further, but never to the extent where we completely lose our audience.